I'm looking forward to it. Oh, thank you, Stephen. If you have your Bibles, let me invite you to be turning there. I'll give you a little bit of extra time because if you're like me, it might take a little longer to find Hosea. Uh, some of you may say, I, don't, I didn't know there was a book of Hosea. That's okay. If that's your circumstance, and I look forward to introducing you to the book. Um, if you have trouble finding it, it is all right. That's why your table of contents is there in the front of your Bible. You'll feel free to utilize that. No shame in that. Hosea, beginning at chapter 1 this morning, uh, I, did, I was sharing with the first service. I'm not sure that uh, our building can handle two Ken Laws here working on a daily basis, but somehow, some way, we will make that, uh, we'll make that work. But Amy's a great addition to our staff. We look forward to what God will do through her. Summertime is upon us. Very excited for this opportunity for the Ken Laws growing up. That meant a trip to the beach virtually every summer. And that's so when you guys, and I've seen where some of you vacation at the beach, like um, our beach looked like slum compared to some of your <laughs> travels to Florida and uh, the the, uh, the, the, down on the Gulf Coast, but, but we would go to the beaches of North Carolina, South Carolina, every, virtually every summer, and we would find uh, somewhere to stay, and on the best summers, we would stay somewhere to add a pool, but generally speaking, my parents, would, I would spend all my time in the water, in the ocean, or in the pool. My mom and dad would spend all their time on the shore soaking up the rays, and almost always, my mom would have a book in her hand. And uh, most of the time, at least in those early years, it would be uh, a Harlequin romance. Now, some of you are young and you have no idea what I'm talking about. How many of you know what a Harlequin romance book is? Okay, well, we're all embarrassed that that's the case, but we do. Uh, it was uh, sort of these um, uh, cheap, sort of trashy, <laughs> um, easy to read love stories, if you will. Um, my mom, by the way, she has since graduated from that. She is walking closer to Jesus, and so now she reads Amish love stories. <laughs> True story. So I don't know what that entails. I don't know if Josiah picks up Hildebrand and they go out for a uh, special night of like uh, uh, shoe uh, branding horses. I don't know. I don't know what that. I don't know what that involves. But but she's she's made the transition. But um, but but there's always these these love stories. Well, t- today we're sort of embarking on this journey, uh, a summer through one of the great love stories of the Bible. And it's one that is, um, it's not trashy, it's not like, it's not just emotional or, um, or, or, or sensual or, um, or romantic, if you will, simply in nature. It is a love story for the ages, and it's the kind of story that speaks to the heart of men and women of all ages alike, because it's a story that at one level is about um, this couple named Hosea and Gomer, and if you're like, I don't even know which of those will be the guy and the girl. We'll get that around to that in just a minute. But this love story between this, this husband and wife, uh, uh, Hosea and Gomer, but at a much deeper level, it's really the story about the unique love of God for his unfaithful people, uh, a broken people, a needful people, a pursuing love that would not let them go. And, and by extension, it speaks to God's unique love for broken people like like you and me. And so to, to give us some context this morning as we launch into this book, Hosea is the first of the 12 minor prophets of the Old Testament. The last 12 books of your English Bible are these minor prophets. It's the first of those 12. And they're called minor not because they are unimportant. It just means that they're brief. They are short by comparison to Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, etc. And so they're these shorter books and they cover um, a period of time from around uh, the 7th century to the, um, to, I'm sorry, the 8th century to the 5th century B.C. So that last bit of time for the people of God until those 400 years of silence, remember, between the, the Old and New Testament, and then that silence is broken when um, John the Baptist arrives on the scene declaring the coming of the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world and then Christ's arrival on the scene. These are the books that lead us up to that sort of intertestamental period. Now we'll see more about the specific um, time frame for Hosea in just a moment, but it roughly divides into the first three chapters that sort of highlight and speak to um, this human relationship as a metaphor for God and his people. And then the last several chapters are all sort of the, the expanding, applying of the message of God's mercy for his people. It is a book that is um, a message of both warning and hope. And as we were um, gathering and praying this morning for our services with our worship team, with those who are serving today, I was sharing this, I was asking, we're praying that I think that both those things should be felt. 
Now, sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes we need to be confronted. Sometimes we need to look long into the mirror. Sometimes we need to own where we are so that we can see where we are and where change needs to occur so that we can do that. So, so on the one hand, there, there's a message of warning here. There's a, a, a message of, um, of, of coming judgment that God is declaring to the people of Israel through Hosea that is, um, that is cutting and in some ways is painful to hear and to wrestle with. But at the same time, it holds out for us this incredible hope that is a result of this unrelenting, incredible love of God for his people, both then and now, that sustains and strengthens us. And so if I, if I could sort of um, uh, summarize in a singular phrase or statement, not just the first chapter, but really the whole of the book of Hosea, I, I, I would put it this way, that though sin demands judgment from God, there is still hope in him. Though sin demands judgment from God, there is still hope in him. Three things that I want us to see as we launch into this first chapter this morning. Notice, first of all, that we, are, we learn, uh, we are, have described for us an unfaithful people. Look at verse 1. The word of the Lord which came to Hosea, the son of Beri. And this is this, what we have about Hosea. We primarily will know just from what we find in this book. The word of the Lord which came to Hosea during the days of, notice, of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Hosea's name is the same root as the names of, of Joshua and Jesus. It means to save, to deliver. And notice it says, this is the word of the Lord that came to Hosea. This is not Hosea's musings about God. Hosea's not sitting under a tree and he has some thoughts and decides to put them in the writing, hoping that maybe that will incur. No, this is what God is declaring to his people through Hosea. It is a message from and of God. And the time frame he provides for us, he provides by naming these four kings from the southern kingdom of Judah and this one king, Jeroboam II, this, uh, in the, the kingdom of Israel. It reminds us this is during the divided kingdom. You'll recall that Israel was at the height of its power and prominence under Saul and David and Solomon. And after Solomon's death, the, the nation of Israel ends up in this, in this civil war of sorts and ends up with two kingdoms. A northern kingdom of Israel maintains the name. Uh, ten tribes of Judah, of the Jews, represented there. And then the southern kingdom of Judah, still the location of Jerusalem, the, all, the, the place where the line of David continues through the kings that are there. But, but Hosea is a prophet to the northern kingdom, to the kingdom of, of, of Israel during this time of the divided kingdom, and he does so in, in roughly the 750s to toward the 715, 720 B.C. Jeroboam, the then king, Jeroboam II, he mentions here in verse 1, has brought Israel to a brief a moment of, of, of success, of strength, of political peace, of economic prosperity, of, of pushing out borders and gaining um, land and gaining people. Uh, so economically, geopolitically, the nation, the kingdom rather of Israel is doing very well. Morally and spiritually, they are growing in bankruptcy. They are defiled. They are increasingly wicked. In fact, that what we will find throughout the book of Hosea is any number of issues of the time that are named. Here are just a few that we'll see as we make our way through. They were offering unacceptable sacrifices. They were disobeying God's law. There was a lack of righteousness and justice in the land. There was sexual misconduct, dishonesty, drunkenness, murder, trusting in their own strength, turning to other gods, looking to other nations for help rather than trusting God, and ingratitude toward God for the great blessings that they enjoyed. Does that not sound a lot like the land where we live today doesn't sound very far removed from where we live right now and we don't have to look very far as we look at the news today it this it just in the past week of just how how, how um radically um uh, perverse and increasingly perverse it seems that our culture is becoming in that culture there was this growing intermingling of uh, the worship of Yahweh, the God of the Jewish people, and the worship of Baal, this pagan God of fertility and of weather. And it will reach such a point, as we'll see in a couple of weeks, that God's people didn't even really know the difference between Yahweh and Baal. They sort of conglomerated into some new God, if you will, of their own making. And that sort of worship of other gods or that sort of idolatry that existed among God's people in the Old Testament is often described as spiritual adultery. 
That God has drawn a people to himself to be his unique people, to love them, to provide for them, to care for them, to bless all the peoples of the earth through them. But they have in turn turned from a love for God and they have pursued other lovers. They have pursued other gods. They have pursued other things that they have come to love and treasure and value more than God. And this is the condition of the people as Hosea is now a prophet to them, speaking of what is happening among them then and what God was going to do in the future and what the ultimate future would hold. And so God is going to call, though, now for Hosea, he's the man, he's the prophet, to do the unimaginable. Verse 2, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, he said to Hosea, go take yourself to yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry, for the land commits flagrant harlotry forsaking the Lord. The Old Testament prophets were often, they would proclaim things, they would predict things, but they would also at times demonstrate things. And God called on them to do some kind of, what we would consider some sort of wacky stuff sometimes, but they, they serve as sort of a, a living metaphor, sort of a living sermon illustration, a, 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 a living embodiment, if you will, of what it is that God is trying to declare to, to reveal to, like a living object lesson for his people to see and to hear. And God calls Hosea to be a living embodiment of his message by going and marrying a woman who will not be faithful to him. He says, take a wife who will be unfaithful, a wife of harlotry, which speaks of a a married woman unfaithful to her husband, but it could also speak of a prostitute. So consider what God is asking Hosea to do. I want you to go and marry a woman who, who you know up front is going to be unfaithful to you, is going to cheat on you, is going to mistreat you, is going to publicly shame you by virtue of how she is going to handle this relationship. And this is going to be how God, this is going to be the story. This is going to be a relationship that God is going to use to describe the relationship that he has with his people Israel. He is the faithful husband. Israel is the unfaithful bride who has turned to these other loves, turned to these other gods, and has prostituted herself out in these varying ways. Now, whether she begins as unfaithful and then becomes uh, and continues to be promiscuous, whether she was faithful and then she'll marry and then she is going to be unfaithful, we're not told. But, but certainly there is, there, there, this woman was, uh, Gomer was a, a woman of, pros, uh, of, of promis- promiscuity, of adultery, of, of unfaithfulness. And again, she is a picture for, for the people of and, and through Hosea of what, how the people have responded to God. Now, is not lost on me. As I was sharing, we were in message review this week, I was talking about you know, praying through and thinking through the reality that this is a painful subject for a lot of people in the room because a lot of you have, there are many of you, probably all of us who have been touched by some infidelity of this sort. And whether it's happened to you through a spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend or whether it's happened um, uh, in the life of somebody that you love and you care about and you've tried to come alongside them and walk with them through those hard things, most of us in this room have been touched by, have been impacted by this sort of infidelity, this sort of um, unfaithfulness to, um, to marital vows or to um, relational commitment to one another. Most of us in the room have been, have been touched by that and we know the pain that that brings. We know the, the hardship. We know the heartbreak we know the tears and the brokenness that that brings to the heart of the one who is being who is experiencing that unfaithfulness and and when we hear that and when we feel that the intention of God is that we would acknowledge that they would acknowledge that that feeling is exactly is a is a picture of the experience of God toward his people when we are unfaithful when we are adulterous when we are promiscuous when we pursue other gods. God says this is the picture of perversity and wicked unfaithfulness of Israel who has committed flagrant harlotry forsaking the Lord. And I think what's further painful for us in the room is to acknowledge that sometimes and in many cases we identify more with Gomer than we do with Hosea. And we have a propensity toward and a... um, a leaning toward that sort of adultery and that sort of idolatry 
I, I think that for, for me growing up, when I heard idol, I almost exclusively thought of like some, some wooden carved something that somebody might put on their mantle or put up in their home and would bow down to or burn incense to or, or bring um, sacrifices to. But the reality is that the Bible speaks of idols as, in, in, a, in a much broader sense, that idols are, are any of those things in our lives that we tr- love, treasure, value, adore more than God. And there are any number of things in our lives that can become idols in that way, even good things that become, uh, that we begin to um, handle in not so good ways, such that we begin to love, treasure, adore, value those things above God. I think there are a lot, honestly, I think there are a lot of parents today who idolize their children. And we are far more concerned with, with our kids and their safety and their desires and making them happy than we are even the heart of God. I think that for many people, we can make our jobs an idol and success an idol and comfort an idol and safety an idol. And we begin to love, treasure, value, adore these things in our lives more than we do God. We, 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 we have success. We, we experience economic prosperity. God blesses us. And instead of letting that move us to look to God in worship and adoration, we let it look, uh, lead us to look in the mirror to think how great we are, how how sharp we are, how smart we are, how hard we worked, how, how wonderful we are, or, or look to others to thank them for what they've done and never even give thought to the God who's provided every good thing in our lives. That is the same similar idolatry to what we find described of the people of God during Hosea's time, the things that he is warning them about. And so these words of, of God through Hosea to Israel should not lead to um, a 2024 group of Christians sitting in a room like this and sort of figuratively in our minds sort of wagging our fingers at those naughty Israelites back then that are so out of tune and so out of touch and, and you shameful, sinful people. You're so foolish that you worship Baal, this other God, and you didn't acknowledge. You're so foolish. You're so silly. Shame on you. No, it should prompt us to a, an honest reflection, to a, a, a personal soul searching that invites God, show me. Show me in my life whatever it is that I've come to love, treasure, value, adore more than you because that is an idol and I am being unfaithful. I am being promiscuous. I am cheating on you. I am chasing after other lovers in that case. And so God, I want to turn my heart back to yours. God made us for himself. God made us to find our purpose, meaning and value in him. God made us for relationship with him and we we will set him straight in our lives. When he says, if you'll uh, seek God in his righteousness, all these other things will be added. When we put God first, God will address everything everything else in our lives. But, but when we sort of begin to set him aside and we begin to idolize other things, then we are moving in a direction that God describes here, it seems to me, as wicked, as dangerous, as foolish. God doesn't wink at it. God doesn't think it's cute. God doesn't think it's something to ignore. God doesn't just turn his cheek and say, hey, keep doing your thing. Keep being promiscuous. Keep, uh, keep chasing after others. Keep cheating on me. It's cool. I'm okay with it because I'm all love and warm and fuzzy. No, God cares. God sees it for the perversity and for the wickedness and for the foolishness and for the danger that it is for us. And how does he respond to that infidelity? Does he, again, does he just sort of turn and just let us keep doing our thing? Or does he get so mad that he just crushes us and says, I want nothing more to do with you? Well, that brings us to a second thing I want you to see, and that is the truth about consequences the truth about consequences, not only will Hosea's relationship to Gomer be a living sort of story to the people, but so will the names of his children. Now, I don't know about you, but like when Buffy and I, before our kids came into the world, like we, we thought about and we talked a lot about their names and we looked through those books of names and we tried to come up with what, what, what we thought would be the right names for our kids. We put a lot of thought and a lot of heart into it and connections to our family and other things. And a lot of you have done the same with your kids as well. And, and, and so can you imagine when God says, hey, I'm gonna, I'm, you're going to have children in your home, but I'm going to reserve the right to name them. And then he's not going to name them like Susie and Bobby and what? No, no, listen to what, listen to the names that he's going to choose. Pick up at verse three. Hosea went and he 
was obeying to God, and he took Gomer, the daughter of Diblium, and he said, golly. No, I'm, that's, sorry, that's terrible. Some of you aren't even old enough to know, no, Gomer Powell, USMC. He went to Gomer, the, <laughs> that's bad. My kids will be embarrassed. Uh, my daughter, my wife probably is. The Gomer, the, they, he took Gomer, the daughter of Diblium, and she conceived and bore him a son. Notice that because we'll see some, somewhat different in the, in the um, stream of things in just a moment. She bore him a son, and the Lord said to him, name him Jezreel. For yet a little while, and I will punish the house of Jehu. That's the original sort of founding member of this dynasty of kings that has led down to the current king of Israel, Jeroboam II. I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel and put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Jezreel literally means God sows or God scatters. But Jezreel is a location, it is a valley where um, a number of Old Testament stories unfold and they are full of violence and of bloodshed. This is where Jehu, again, the head of this dynasty, Jeroboam being a few generations down, this is where Jehu, through great bloodshed, through a murderous ex excess, through a bloody massacre, took first took the reign as king of the kingdom of Israel. And it seems here that God is declaring that, that, that he is going to bring violence upon the house of Jehu. He is going to bring this dynasty of kings to an end. And at the same time, he's going to bring Israel, the kingdom itself, to an end there at the valley. And, and in fact, we discover that historically, Jeroboam the second son, Zechariah, only reigns for like six months before he's assassinated. And then that dynasty does, in fact, come to an end. And the kingdom of Israel will ultimately come to an end at the hands of the Assyrians who will lay siege to them. And so God declares through Jezreel that he is going to bring the dynasty, is going to bring the kingdom to an end. Now, look at verse 6. He said in verse 3 that Gomer bore Hosea a son. But notice this second child, a daughter is born, verse 6, she conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Now, it doesn't say gave birth to, um, she conceived again and gave to Hosea a child. It may be that her promiscuity at this point is such that they don't know who the father may be. But he said, they gave, he, she gives birth to a daughter, and the Lord said to him, name her Lo-Ruhamah, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel that I would ever forgive them. I will have compassion on the house of Judah and deliver them by the Lord their God. And I will not deliver them by bow, sword, battle, horses, or horsemen. The kingdom of Judah is going to continue on for another century and a half after the kingdom of Israel falls. They will not, Judah will not fall to, um, to the Assyrians. God will protect them, not because of their might, but by God's protection. But he says here, call this daughter, lo Ruhama, no compassion, no mercy. God is going to remove his protection from his people. They have presumed upon him. They have ignored him. They have just assumed that God was cool with whatever. And they have experienced his blessings without giving gratitude to him for them and acknowledging him. And so God says, I'm going to remove my blessing. I'm going to remove my compassion. I'm going to remove my covering for a season, not forever, but for a season and allow you to experience the consequences of your choices. And he did that when the Assyrians come in 720, it happened in Hosea's lifetime in 722 BC when the Assyrians laid siege to the region and ultimately took hold of the region and carried God's people away into exile. And every time, imagine, every time Lo Ruhama's name is spoken in wherever she may be and whenever mom or dad calls out, Lo Ruhama, come over here, that every time people hear no compassion, no mercy, it was a reminder of what God was saying through Hosea to his people. There's a third child, verse 8, when she had weaned Lohurama, so probably two or three years in that culture, she conceived and gave birth to a son, a second son now. And again, we're not told that this is Hosea's child. We don't know. The Lord said, name him lo Ami, for you are not my people and I am not your God. This is the most painful, um, damaging, if you will, name of all because the very God who at Mount Sinai said, you will be my people and I will be your God. Now God says, you're not my people and I'm not your God. You have chosen to reject me. You have chosen to go your own way. You have chosen to pursue other gods. And so, again, this is not a permanent abandonment, but God is going to pull back for a time. 
to allow them to experience the consequences of their choices of pursuing these other gods, of ignoring the true God, of cheating on God, of pursuing other lovers outside of God rather than being faithful to God. And that will again come in the form of the Assyrians in the 700s B.C., What God is making very clear here is that he uh, is not indifferent toward, he is not ignoring, he will not simply overlook their choices, that their sin had consequences and that God took their sin seriously. When a nation or an organization or an individual continually rejects God, cheats on God, pursues other lovers rather than God, there comes a time when God allows such people to experience the consequences of their choices. Because the same God that we herald for his love has also revealed himself to be a God who is holy and who is just and who does not ignore and does not wink at sin. And I think that we are seeing, I think we're seeing this um, play out in our nation right now. I think we are seeing that the forsaking of even a most basic of, of Judeo-Christian values that once um, largely, not, not perfectly, we, I don't know that we were ever a Christian nation, but, but the, those values that once largely sort of shaped and molded the culture and the life of this nation, we have, have largely been forsaken. And I think that we are seeing uh, in the news this week across college campuses, I think we see it in uh, even a, a denomination turning to embrace um, uh, LGBTQ plus uh, lifestyle and behavior and, and um, pastors and leaders. Like I think we are seeing the results of we are seeing the outcomes of a people who turn from God, who turn from truth, and who pursue other loves and who pursue other gods and ignore the true and the living God. But that doesn't just happen to nations and organizations. That happens in the lives of, of people. That we sow seed in our choices, our actions, our decisions, and then we reap the harvest of that through the consequences. Paul said this in Galatians 6, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, this will he also reap. The one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. The one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. This is, again, this is, um, this, this book is uncomfortable in that it is a warning And if we take it in context and if we own it personally, if we're willing to open our spiritual ears and hear, it is is uncomfortable to us because because it challenges us to, to, to be honest with ourselves and honest before God and to acknowledge that we cannot sneak around on God, we will not cheat on God and not get caught. That we do in fact reap what we sow. But even, even in the reaping of, um, of painful consequences, it is, it is the work of a gracious God in our lives. See, God made us to find purpose, meaning, value, love, joy, all the, to find those in him. And when we turn from him and look for those things in other places or in other people, then he will not let us continue in that direction for too long before he will somehow bring an end to that, that whatever that, that, that sowing of seed in that direction away from him, we will reap the harvest. But when we do, it's not because he hates us. It's because he loves us and he's drawn us back to himself. And so we shouldn't be surprised that sometimes people will go through tremendous marital hardship because somewhere along the way they turned that spouse into an idol and are looking to that person to bring them fullness of joy and happiness and satisfaction all the things that only God can ultimately provide we're looking for in that person and when that person can't live up to what it is that we are in need of then all of a sudden it creates a tension between us but even that tension is God's grace to help us see that that person was never intended to provide for us what only God could provide in our lives I've seen um, people that I think who made an idol out of sports at times, who have had, um, who've had um, 
injury or accident, and I believe God used those, um, that reality to turn their hearts away from that idolatry of that sport and to draw them back to God. I believe that there are some of us who have gone through economic challenges because we'd put our full confidence in our money and in our jobs, and God uses that challenge, a, a reaping of what we have sown in, in terms of loving and idolize our job or material things God has used to draw our hearts back to Him. Because God loves, listen, God loves you too much to let you waste your life and your eternity away on pursuing and loving and valuing and treasuring things that could never ultimately satisfy your heart. So again, even the hard things, even the painful consequences are the actions of a gracious God who, who is relentlessly pursuing and is allowing us, he may, with, he may allow us to, to experience the consequences of our choices for a season, but he does so not because he's trying to hurt us, but because he's trying to woo us back to himself. So knowing how prone we are, knowing how prone the, nation, the, the kingdom of Israel was, knowing how prone we are to wonder from God, like what hope do we have? toward the future. Given our propensity to cheat on God is God's heart that he he would either just completely do away with us or eradicate us or or he would condemn us in such a way that he enjoys uh, asserting pain in our lives because, because he's getting even with us for our forsaking him. No, 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 no. Listen, I want you to see thirdly, this is the hope that we have. Here's, here's where we see, we see this warning And then we see this incredible message of hope come up again and again. And it is always centered in not our performance, but in God's love, the relentless love of a merciful God. Notice verse 10 begins with a little word there, three letters in the New American Standard, the word yet. My people have been unfaithful. My people have been adulterous. My people have been promiscuous. My people have been idolatrous. And I'm going to allow them for a season to face the the consequences of their choices that for them is going to include a nation and outside people who will surround them, who will starve them, who will hold them captive, who will then come in and carry them away captives as slaves into a foreign country. Yet, the number of the sons of Israel, verse 10 says, will be like the sand of the sea that cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, it will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. And the sons of Judah and the sons of Israel will be gathered together and they will appoint for themselves one leader and they will go up from the land for great will be the day of Jezreel. And chapter two, verse one really better fits with chapter one. Say to your brothers, Ami, my people, and to your sisters, Ruhama, favored or shown mercy or shown compassion. That despite the fact that Jews have been unfaithful to God, the Jews of the northern kingdom of Israel, they have not kept the covenant that God made with Moses. They have, they have not held up to the laws. They have proven themselves to be unfaithful again and again and again. And they are going to reap the consequences of their sinful choices. And yet, or in the New Testament, we often see it, but God... Like this is, this is the testimony of all who belong to God, Old Testament, New Testament. Like we are a wreck. We are a mess. We are prone to wonder. We are prone to spiritual adultery. We are prone to fail yet or but God. What does God do? Well, he says here, using covenant language that comes out of, out of God's covenant with Abraham. A covenant, remember, that was unconditional, not based on Abraham or his performance, but based on God and his character. He says that God will declare that this nation that is somewhat puny in numbers will one day be as numberless as a sand on the beach, just as God promised Abraham and Jacob back in Genesis. That they will again be a part of the acknowledged people who belong to the living God. That the now divided kingdom of Israel and Judah will one day be reunited as a people brought back together by God. They will be brought together under one leader. One leader who chapter 3 verse 5 says is of the Davidic line. a One who would come from the line and lineage of David. One who we believe to be the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. And they will again grow and multiply and be the people of God despite this their shortcomings, despite their wickedness, despite years of spiritual adultery and idolatry, God has a plan and purpose for them and they will ultimately be rescued and redeemed not because of their goodness, but because of God's unrelenting love and mercy. 
So two interesting notes here. One, both Paul and Peter reference verses from this section to speak of God's grafting in the Gentiles, that those who are not God's people will now be called God's people. God is creating a, a kingdom for himself that includes Jew and Gentile alike. But secondly, the ultimate fulfillment of this promise of God that we find here and throughout Hosea will come as described in Romans 11 in the future. That God has not turned his back on his people. God has not rejected Jerusalem or, or Israel forever. That in the events of the end times, God is going to again do a great work in and through his chosen people. And in fact, the valley of Jezreel that's mentioned here is also known as the valley of Megiddo or the place of Armageddon. It is the location where the, the revelation describes Jesus exerting his full and final victory over Satan and his forces. That indeed, as verse 11 says, great will be the day of Jezreel. And so as we continue through Hosea, we're going to see these themes again and again and again of the, of the wickedness of spiritual adultery and the reality of coming judgment, but also the pursuing, beautiful, relentless, wonderful, amazing love of God for those who are his. That God's love for his covenant people will... Um, will prevail, that they will again be made a people. He will draw them to himself. He will forgive their sins. They will be brought into a new age of blessing under the Savior and the Messiah, King Jesus. This is a love story for the ages. Not first and foremost about Gomer and Hosea, but about God and his people. Gomer, the picture of, the embodiment of unfaithful, promiscuous Israel, idolatrous Israel, Hosea, the image of the, the loving, faithful husband who will not forsake, it, will not let go of his bride. The reality is that, that Gomer's only hope was in a love that she never deserved, which is the same hope that we have as well. Paul would write to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.13 that even when we are faithless, God remains faithful. The hope that we have toward the future, friends, is not in our strong grip on God because we are prone to let go and pursue and chase after other things, other lovers, other idols. The hope that we have, that we are his now and will be forever, as it was with Israel, it is with us, is not on our grip on God, but it's God's grip on us. The grip of a merciful, gracious, loving father and pursuer who will not let us go. And so here's how I would challenge us to consider responding today and wrapping up. We are so... Um, we are so conditioned by, um, by church and by um, Christian books and literature and songs and other things today to, to quickly move past lament or brokenness or repentance and to, um, to always focus on and speak about and think about a God who is all love all the time. And that's all that we know. We, we know nothing of justice. We know nothing of holiness. We, we just hone in on this God who is loving and because he's loving, he just lets us live any way we want to live, do whatever we want to do. We could just do any old way and, and that he, as if he, he doesn't care. And what this and really the whole of the Bible confronts is the reality that he cares very much. And so we would do well as a people to pause and to reflect and to invite the Spirit of God to show us. Lord, where have idols crept in? Where have, where have I turned to pursue other loves? Where, what in my life do I love, treasure, value, adore more than you? that I need to repent of and to turn from um, even good things put in wrong positions in my heart to put them back in their rightful place and to put you back in your rightful spot on the throne of my heart and my life through renewed surrender to you to invite God to show us that need in our own hearts and lives.
Some of you may be facing some, um, some hard consequences in your life right now that are the result of um, painful, um, sinful choices along the way. And not everything is that way, by the way. The Bible is clear that some hard things we go through, God just allows because ultimately it brings glory as he works in and through those things to shape us, to mold us, to reveal himself through those things. But, but it also does remind us, it does share with us, that there are some things that, are, that we face that are, that are hard things or painful things, and they are, we are reaping what we have sown. And so when we don't know the difference, then the only way I know to deal with that is to look to God and say, God, I, I, I don't know, but... Would you show me if what I'm currently going through is intended by you to reveal something in my heart that I'm not currently aware of that needs to be dealt with, confronted, and addressed? And if you'll ask him, he'll show you. He'll reveal it in his time and in his way. And so this morning, I'm just encouraging us to to not quickly move past the need to honestly reflect and search our hearts and invite the Spirit of God to reveal what's going on in our own hearts and lives, where idols have taken root that need to be uprooted, where things need to be put in their rightful place, where God needs to take his rightful place on the, on the throne of our hearts and our lives. And as we do that, then at the self-same time, we can, all of God's people can look and be overwhelmed and blown away by the fact that despite the many times that we've all wondered His love and His mercy are unrelenting and He will not let you go. In fact, He loves you so much that He will not let you find the fullness of joy and peace and all those things in other things or in other people and other circumstances because none of those things can do what only God can do. And God will, whatever He needs to bring about in our lives, will do to draw us back to Himself, to turn our hearts back to Him, to acknowledge His love and that His love would then lead us to repentance. His kindness would lead us to draw back to Him and give Him His rightful place. And so, and so what is God revealing in your heart? Maybe he's challenging you and inviting you to worship and adore him. They're blown away again by the magnitude of his love for you. And it may be that you're here this morning and you've never surrendered to him. You have spent your life trying to find purpose and meaning and hope and all kinds of things. And no matter how much you enjoy them for a season, they always end up falling short. They always end up disappointing. They always end up letting you down. And maybe for up to this point, you haven't figured out why that's the case, but, but it's because God loves you so much. He so desires a relationship with you that he will shut all those things down. And reveal to you that those things cannot, nothing else in your life can provide for you what only God can provide for you in his son, Jesus. And if you will turn in yieldedness to him, and if you will give your life to him, and if you will trust that Jesus satisfied the justice of God on the cross on your behalf, through his death, through his burial, through his resurrection, so that through faith in him, you could know God. If you'll turn and surrender to him today, Jesus will accept you. Jesus will love you, Jesus will redeem you, Jesus will save you, and Jesus will set you right with God the Father for now and for all eternity. So can I invite you just to, we'll keep this a very brief moment, but can I invite you just for a moment to bow your heads, to close your eyes where you are, and to invite the Spirit of God, whatever He wants to say to you today, whatever He wants to reveal to you this morning, whatever it is that He's wanting you to pause and not to move too past or too quickly from, but to but to pause and to reflect and to wrestle and to invite the Spirit to reveal, like, ask Him, show you. God, what have I come to love, treasure, value, adore more than you? Reveal it to my heart so that I can put it in its rightful place. And Jesus, I can put you in the rightful place as the King and the leader and the master of my life, the Lord, the leader of my heart. And if you don't know him, then turn to him and invite Christ now to save you, to forgive you, to lead you as you trust in him and him alone, to make you right with a holy God, to come to the end of your pursuit of religion and to surrender fully to God in a relationship with him that comes only through his son, Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you a moment to pray and then I'll, I'll pray for us. Father, I know my own heart is prone to wonder. It's 
prone to um, forgetfulness, a propensity toward pride and um, the desire to appease and uh, please people versus first and foremost to, um, to please you. That even good things and good people in my life that I love and treasure dearly and that, that you have blessed me with, that I can give them a place in my heart that, that would rival yours and that would, um, that would lead me to, to love or treasure or value them more than you. And God, I acknowledge this morning that those things are, um, those things are not just things you wink at or ignore. They're, they're sinful things. They're wicked things. They're dangerous things. They're unhealthy spiritually things. God, I know that's not just the propensity of my heart, but, of, but for all of us. And so, God, we find great comfort in your relentless pursuing love that will not let us go. That even some of the hard things that we may go through, you utilize to bring us to the end of ourselves and to put other things in their rightful place so that we will turn again to you in fullness of surrender because it's in you that we find life and purpose and value and meaning and joy and peace and all the things that we were made for and all the things our hearts crave. And so God, even when we leave this morning and we go about our day and the routines of this coming week, would you, would you not let us just quickly set aside what you might be saying to our hearts? And even as we look to ourselves and place our hearts and open them up before you to reveal any idols that we need to confront and deal with within ourselves at the same time, Lord, balance that with continually drawing our eyes to you, the faithful, loving, gracious God who is unrelenting in your ongoing work to sanctify, to transform, to mature us, to make us like your son, to ready us for eternity. Lord, thank you. God, thank you that this is good news that we can share with a a hurting world to our neighbors and to the nations that God is holy, God is just, God cannot and will not ignore sin, but God has provided a way that that sin could be confronted through his son, Jesus Christ. Lord, that's good news. May we live to declare and to live and to sound that good.